democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Tonight on the Fifth Estate, they were the most unlikely troublemakers. Oh, I was not an activist. I never attended a political rally in, in my life. There were thousands of them, ordinary Canadians on the streets at Toronto's G20, protesting peacefully until the police shut them down. They're dragging me over the concrete, and I'm screaming, trying to get their attention. Now, the stories you haven't heard. This trip searched me about 20 hours after they arrested me. The pictures you haven't seen. Whoa, 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 hey! Get back! Get back! Get back. Let's go. The summit from the street. We are leaving! We are leaving! And the people who never dreamed this would happen to them. Okay! 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 okay. 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 I think we did our best. I, I think, Is that I think, good enough? Um, well, that, frankly, will be for others to judge. Good evening and welcome. I'm Gillian Findlay. It has been eight months since the G20, and the iconic images are still with us. Burning police cars, rampaging mobs, the massive security presence that, according to the official story, is all that stood between Canada's largest city and chaos. But that was never the whole story about what happened that weekend in June. And eight months later, shocking new images continue to emerge, captured on cell phones and minicams by participants who found themselves on the other side of all that G20 order. For some of you, the stories you'll hear tonight will raise questions about what protest means in this country, what the limits to dissent have become. But others will have the same reaction so many have had since those days in June. It's what we call our program tonight. You should have stayed at home. Prior to the G20 weekend in Toronto, I was a Canadian dude uh, named Tommy Taylor who grew up in Mississauga with my mom and my dad and my two younger brothers. Tommy Taylor is hardly what you'd call a political animal. Born in the suburbs, the playwright and aspiring director lives in downtown Toronto with his girlfriend. I was not an activist. I never attended a political rally in my life. When I heard that the G20 was coming, I'm like, well, I'm going to see what this is about. He didn't have far to look. The first rally of the weekend started right across from his apartment. This camaraderie or this spirit is just, you know, something that most of my generation see in like stock footage from civil rights protests and stuff like that. When I was like, I can't, I can't wait for tomorrow. On Friday, the world's power brokers weren't even in Toronto. G8 leaders were meeting two hours north in cottage country. It wouldn't be until the morning that they joined the rest of the G20 behind that newly constructed security fence. World summits have long been targets for peaceful protesters and violent demonstrators alike. 10,000 police officers were in Toronto from all across the country. And they weren't the only ones arriving. We were a really big group from Quebec. It was all people from different groups, diff different universities. That afternoon, Maurice Poisson was on a bus, part of a convoy making its way from Montreal. She was coming to protest peacefully. The group had arranged to sleep in a gym at the University of Toronto. It was really interesting to get to know the people that you, we were going with. I would say the, the, the general feeling was really good. There was a lot of energy. 
On Saturday, the summit started for real. The rest of the leaders arrived, greeted by Toronto's mayor. Days before, David Miller had encouraged Torontonians not to be intimidated by all that security. We support people's democratic right to dissent. Um, there were some people at this table who may have been in the odd protest themselves. In an effort to control the protesters, the police designated Queen's Park, Ontario's legislature, as a so-called free speech zone. And as this eyewitness video shows, by noon, the zone was filling up. Tell me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! Dissent had many faces that day, an abundance of causes, and people who were marching for all kinds of reasons. Actually, I wasn't planning on going. Um, I knew my daughter wanted to go. John Prine is no one's idea of a rebel. He works for Revenue Canada. He runs a small tree farm on the side, and it was an accident on the farm that cost him his leg. When his daughter said she was going to the summit, John and his wife decided to tag along. We don't see my daughter a lot because she's away at university, so we were going to have like a, a family weekend together here in Toronto and uh, see the G20 and see Toronto. More than 10,000 people turned out to march Saturday afternoon. Organized by the Canadian Labour Congress, they were accompanied by hundreds of Toronto police. How did you make out walking with your leg all that distance? Well, it was a slow walk, so it was fine for me, and I was taking my time. I had two walking sticks with me, and uh, no, it wasn't much of a problem at that time. Did you see much of a police presence at the beginning? Y yes, it was, there was a massive police presence at the beginning. There were police, and it seemed in full riot gear, and I was surprised by that. that right away, they, they seemed to be so... I guess I would say aggressive. As this amateur video shows, aggression was building in some parts of the crowd. As thousands marched peacefully, handfuls of vandals started breaking away and were soon doing their worst. Just blocks away at Toronto's police headquarters, police chief Bill Blair was watching it all unfold on monitors. And I'm responsible as the chief of police in Toronto for the safety of my city, and and I could see that property was being damaged, and and I think it was it was it was this very significant risk. A significant risk, but where were his officers? Look at the video, riot police half a block away, who were ordered, the chief says, to fall back and guard the summit site. As the vandals rampage, mobile police heading in the opposite direction, ordered to stay with the march rather than intervene. The car, the car might have gas in it. So... By the time abandoned cruisers were set on fire, it was apparent that those in command had made a big mistake. Were the police caught flat-footed? Sounds like it. Uh, my strong preference is that we would have been able to respond in a much quicker way. But the question now, what would police do to regain control? Back at Queen's Park, no one knew about the vandalism. First of the marchers were starting to trickle back to the free speech zone, and as they had been all day, the curious were still trickling in. I mean, I'm a fairly cautious person, so I think if there had been any warning or any like bad signs, I think I would have left right away. <laughs> in all of his 29 years, Dorian Barton has never been to a demonstration, but he and his wife live close to Queen's Park. At 4.30 that afternoon, he wandered over with a friend to have a look. We talked to a few people and like we got one guy to take our picture and that sort of thing. And like I said, it was very friendly. No one seemed particularly angry or upset or anything. But even in this photo, you can see the police starting to amass. By five o'clock, 
the mood began to change. We're trying to protest. We're like the soldiers, man. <laughs> They're stopping us from exercising constitutional rights. They're stopping us from exercising constitutional rights. Having failed to stop the vandals earlier, the police were now on the hunt. Believing the criminals were hiding among the peaceful demonstrators, they moved in. As this eyewitness video makes clear, no one was above suspicion, especially, it seemed, if they were wearing black. Watch here as batons come out. <laughs> then the pepper spray. I'm surrounded. Where can, where can I go? Excuse, where we are peaceful. Where do you want us to go? You know what? You guys instigate riot. As all this was happening, Dorian Barton was oblivious. With his back turned to take a picture, he had no idea of the danger he was now in. And that's when I was uh, hit from the side by an officer with a riot shield. There was really no um, warning at all. Like, the hit really just came out of nowhere, almost like being hit by a car or something like that. Photos that only recently came to light document what happened next. I remember I was definitely um, hit again at least once more. I'm not sure what with, and definitely uh, stepped on. And after that, that's when I remember I was being dragged. First by my one arm, they dragged me like through the line of um, police officers to the paddy wagon. They stood me up and uh, tied my arms behind my back. And that's when I became a bit more aware. I could really notice the really intense pain in my shoulder. So I mentioned that to them. Like I said, I thought my shoulder was broken or dislocated. And they just laughed at me and put me in the paddy wagon. At the same time Dorian Barton was being taken away in the paddy wagon, blocks away, Prime Minister Harper was turning on the charm. Ensconced behind the security fence, the leaders had no way of knowing what was happening on the streets. Stay together, stay together. No way of knowing what was being done in the name of their protection. Watch again now how undercover police appear seemingly out of nowhere. Get back. Get back. Get back. Get out of here. And continue dragging people out of the crowd. What are their orders that we have to get to? Not that I'm aware of, and certainly not that I gave. I think there certainly was a change in, in the police response. We were up until that point in time. Uh, facilitating and managing lawful peaceful protests. We then had a riot to try to suppress and, and criminality we had to prevent. And, and so the, 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 the police response changed in response to the activities that were taking place on the street. Perhaps, but there was no riot at Queen's Park. Where is it? Where's our protest? By late afternoon, John Prime, here in the green shirt and walking sticks, arrived back at the free speech zone with his daughter, looking for his wife. What they found instead was a police barricade. By that time, I was tired. My stump was sore from being on it for a few hours. And then somebody gave the order and, and, and said, move. And then right away, my, my daughter jumped up and I'm still on the ground because it takes me a little longer to get up. And I was off balance. I didn't have my walking sticks in my hands. So I fell back down again. And my daughter's yelling at the police, you know, uh, saying, uh, give him time to give up, give him space. He's got one leg. So they put me in a sitting position and I had my glasses in my mouth. And then one of the, uh, the, the police officers uh, ordered me to walk. And I was like this and I said, I can't. And then uh, the police officer uh, grabbed my leg, uh, one of them, my, my prosthetic leg, and he yanked it off. He just ripped it off. They were dragging me over the concrete, and I'm screaming, trying to get their attention with my glasses in my mouth. I'm going, ah! You know, as loud as I can, because I wanted to let them know how much it was hurting. So it was so strange that they were doing this. They knew I had a disability. Uh, obviously, you know, they had my, they had my leg. <laughs> According 
According to witnesses, the arrest went on for more than an hour. Look what happens to the young man holding up his hands in peace. He just disappears. By the end of Saturday, 291 people were in police custody, including John Fine and Dorian Barton. Let's go. Let's go. We're no use to them arresting. And for the first time in the city's history, police fired rubber bullets at a crowd. Why are you shooting at us? But there was still so much more to come. And people started to ask, do you have a warrant? What's going on? And they just told us, shut up. People calling me a coward. They're coming at me five to one. Calm down, you're arresting peaceful protesters for doing nothing. By the end of the first day of Canada's G20 summit last summer, the arrests were piling up. Detainees, some of whom hadn't even been demonstrating, were being brought by the busload to a specially built detention center in Toronto's East End. John Prine, still missing his prosthetic leg, had to be brought in in a wheelchair. But it was a very long building with a line of cages on one side of it, and uh, I was wheeled into one cage at one end of the building. Mm -hmm. And at first, I was put in, I was in there by myself. Then eventually they bring in somebody else who is also in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed on one side. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that he wasn't even part of the protest, that he had just been wheeling past the police vans on his uh, motorized wheelchair when he was arrested. By now, Dorian Barton's shoulder was swelling badly. He'd told police they'd hurt him, and he wanted help. They said that they would try to get me medical attention at some point, but it right. was probably another four or five hours before I actually saw a medic. Five hours after you came in and said, I think I might have a broken shoulder? That's right, yeah. And were your hands still handcuffed at this point? Yes, they were, yeah. By nightfall, the demos were small. People were starting to go home, or at least trying to, in the case of Tommy Taylor and his girlfriend. Quite frankly, we wanted to get out of there, and every side street looked kind of frightening. We're like, let's stay with people. But as this video shows, at every turn, there was another barricade. They're behind us. They're trapping us. Eventually, Tommy found himself with 200 others stuck in Toronto's hotel district. They stopped in front of the Novotel and someone said that there was some dignitaries from some of the G20 countries staying there. Peaceful protest! Peaceful protest! Peaceful protest! But then, as this chanting was happening, a line of riot police showed up on sort of both ends of the, the street there. As the riot police came in closer, one line of riot police was like, you have to leave, go that way. And you get to the other line, you have to leave, go that way. It's like this insane Orwellian doublespeak at that point, right? It's just like, oh, okay. So you're just, you're trapped. Let us go! Let us go! Let us go! Trapped, and all of them about to be arrested, one by one. By now, police reinforcements had arrived in the city, even though the streets were finally emptying out. Having marched most of the day, Quebec's Maurice Poisson spent the evening in a bar and was trying to make her way back to the gym at the university. We've been stopped twice, uh, searched twice, ask, asked for IDs, and the police was really aggressive. They started to uh, tell us fucking Frenchie, go back to Quebec. Uh, they started to insult us, so I really felt the pressure was going up during the night. 
at 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock. We've been waking up by police coming really, really fast in the gym, uh, yelling at us, don't move, don't move. Stay focused down, all right? Just stay back. Stay back. It was a rude wake-up call. Although half asleep, a number of students pulled out their cameras and started filming. Do you understand? No, no. You're arrested for unlawful assembly. And then, that was in English, then a policeman in French came and told us, you're arrested for a riot. So then we just said, well, unlawful assembly is not the same than a riot. What, what's going on? And people started to, to ask, do you have a warrant? What's going on? And they just told us, shut up. And they started to arrest the people that were talking. So the people that were asking questions were arrested really fast, first. It's really scary, the big gun. It's terrible. It's scary because it's fucking long range weapon, right? I didn't thought they would really arrest us until they handcuffed me at 1 o'clock p.m. So it took six hours for them to proceed people because they were coming in with cameras trying to recognize people. Oh, they had the photos and yeah, they were yeah. trying to see if people yeah. matching those photos yeah, were in exactly. the crowd. Yeah, exactly. So it took a lot of time, but they didn't find anyone. Whatever the students were told at the time, police now claim they were acting on intelligence gathered before the summit that this was a group that had already committed crimes and was planning more. Which would be what? Can you be more specific? Primarily mischief. 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 They were going to... Damage property. Toronto's police chief had never seen the video of the raid, so we showed it to him. All that weaponry to prevent mischief? I mean, look at that. Well, police officers are generally armed, Joanne. And, and I agree. Th they're those, generally armed, but, but, but not but with the, arms like that. Those are tactical officers, and we usually use tactical officers for conducting entry into, into, into a place where there's a reasonable apprehension that violence may occur. But there was no violence that morning. Just 70 university kids in their pajamas were about to be charged with conspiracy. June 27th was actually my 27th birthday as well, so it was just this weird coincidence. And, and uh, so it was, it was strange to be in jail on my birthday. Unlike many of those who went out to protest that weekend, Toronto carpenter Jason McDonald did worry things could go wrong. <laughs> So when he and his sister headed out to join the rallies on Sunday, he took his camera along. You never know what to expect. I, neither of us had any idea what it was going to be like. We didn't think it was going to, especially Sunday. As his video shows, it was protest as usual that afternoon. More police than the day before, but nothing extraordinary happened until the march hit a major intersection four blocks away from where the political leaders were meeting. I, I'm currently moving. This doesn't look good. Next thing we knew, the people started booing, and um, we saw that the direction we'd come from was being closed off by uh, cops moving in in a big line. They cut us off on the north side, just kind of cut through. Do you think you're protecting people? That meant Jason and the 40 others he was with were boxed in, kettled, the police call it, with no way out. Was there anybody in that group that, in all fairness, you could say, look suspicious or would be somebody that the police might well have wanted to keep an eye on? No, I don't, not that I saw, not by any means. They may have been, been under the impression that we were troublemakers, I don't know. But um, once they started closing us in, that's when I started hearing some crying and um, I was backing up filming, but um, I started running out of room. In this video, you can see Jason backing up right there. I kind of glanced to the side and put my hands up, and just as I looked forward again, I took a shield right in the face. We're people! What's wrong with you? Are you fucked? Peaceful protest! Peaceful protest! As the police 
police line tightened, the G20 summit ended, and the parade to the airport began. This intersection was nowhere near the motorcade route, and there was no way these protesters were going anywhere. And I spun around again, just in time to catch a guy that had had his back turned to the line. A couple cops had jumped through the line and just choked him out and uh, dragged him off. And, uh, and then the, the, the group just closed again. At that point, when I saw him get dragged off, I just had a feeling in my gut that I was going to be dragged off as well. Jason's camera did not record the beating he says he then received from police. He later took these photographs as evidence. Hey, I gotta call you back and what's going on there, Aerith, uh, on TV. By evening, pictures of the kettling had been broadcast on all the TV networks, and police were conceding they may have gone too far. <laughs> We're not suggesting that we're perfect. These decisions are made uh, as best as we can at the time with the evidence that we have, uh, things that we're facing. Um, and I, I support our officers that they had the power to do what they did. But by then, Jason had joined more than 1,100 people in that detention center, including all of those we've introduced you to tonight. I woke up that morning, Tommy Taylor, dude from Mississauga directing Shakespeare for high school students to Prisoner 0106 in cell, below, cell block 006 on the detention center on Eastern Avenue. That's, that was my day. Toronto's G20 lasted less than 48 hours. More than 1,100 people were detained and brought to a temporary detention center where new demos were soon happening outside. The whole world is watching! The whole world is watching! The whole world Inside, cameras had been confiscated. Most people were held on something called a breach of peace order, which allows police to detain anyone they think might cause trouble for up to 24 hours, even if they never lay a charge. We are people! Breaching the peace is what Tommy Taylor was accused of after getting caught up in that demonstration outside the hotel. The first thing that every bus in the detention center saw was a row of six, ca six cages, 10 by 20, all the doors off the porta potties inside, people shaking the cages, yelling for water, yelling for their lawyers, uh, women trying to block the doors, because everyone coming in on the buses was watching them go to the bathroom. One of those women was Maurice Poisson, still in her pajamas after being roused from her sleep and arrested with 70 others at the university gym. And it was really, really cold. And it was only concrete. I was with tongs, tongs, shorts, and t-shirts. So the first night was just impossible to sleep. Just impossible. We, we, we could just stand there and we were just freezing. At least John Prine could sit down. He had to. They still hadn't returned his prosthetic leg. In fact, they hadn't done anything. And people were saying they were really thirsty, they were asking for water. We didn't get any food until the morning. The food didn't come probably till 12 hours later. All Dorian Barton wanted was something to stop the pain in his shoulder. He couldn't even get a Tylenol. They said they couldn't because, um, because you know, they could be liable if, if I had a bad reaction. But for many of the young women especially, it was about to get worse. I remember the first girl they took out of her cages. Uh, they handcuffed her to go out and for about 10, 15 minutes and she came back. She was shaking, she was crying and she was yelling to everyone. They, they're starting to strip, strip search everyone. Strip search? Yeah, they, they were strip searching everyone. I was with two officers, two females, and I had to take out all my clothes and um, then they asked me to put the hands on the ground and to cough. It was really, really humiliating. And at this point, they, um, they decided to take my bra 
<laughs> because it had a metal um, things in right. it. Yeah, so they said it's dangerous for me. Yeah. <laughs> But by Sunday afternoon, the real danger was outside, as a detention center became a magnet for people protesting the arrests. When the crowd didn't move quickly enough, tear gas and rubber bullets came out. that afternoon, 10 more detainees in a facility that was already overflowing. When they dropped the 40th prisoner off uh, and the young Toronto Police Services officer, name tag removed, no badge number, which was very common in there. And there is only one reason you take your name tag off in a situation like that. So he puts the last guy in. He's like, well, how many, how many of you guys are in here? And we're like, there's 40 guys in here. And he says, what do they think this is, Auschwitz? Uh, I was just like... This is what the officer said. That's what the officer said. What do they think this is? Auschwitz? And then a little laugh and I walked away. I remember talking to officers a lot, trying to talk with all the officers that were passing by and asking them what was going on, why are we here, uh, what will happen, and telling me I have the rights to see a lawyer, I want to see a lawyer, and different officer just told me, no, you're not, your rights are different because it's the martial law now. At they, least, yeah, at least two or three officers told me it's the martial law. As for Dorian Barton, after being hit by police and dragged through the streets, he was eventually taken to a hospital where he was told that not only his shoulder was dislocated, but his arm had been broken. He was also told that unlike so many others, he would be charged obstructing a police officer in the line of his duty and unlawful demonstration. You were charged with obstructing the yeah, police officer? Yeah, It seemed consistent with the ridiculousness of the situation up to that point. Um, but, it, and also it kind of made sense that, you know, it, I, I felt maybe it was a way for them to cover their backs in terms of having injured me. By Sunday night, the releases had begun. More than 1,100 people were arrested that weekend. 709 were never charged with anything, just shown the door and warned to stop protesting. John Prine knew his 27-hour ordeal was over when he saw a guard carrying his leg in a plastic bag. And he said, you know, there's a bus stop over there and you can make your way back. And I said, well, where's my walking sticks? Where's my glasses? Where's my money? You know, all they had was my driver's license and my leg. I said, how is it going to get on the bus and pay for the bus fare? And he said, well, the bus driver should let you on for free. But <laughs> and I said, well, it's, I said, I won't even be able to see the bus. How am I going to make my way there? And I said, I won't be able to walk there. I, yeah. I said, it's impossible. And so he went back and he talked to the sergeant and he said, well, because of the special circumstances, we'll bring you home in a police cruiser. So that's what they did. I'm not an idiot. I'm not, I'm not stupid. I know that there are worse places in the world. I know there are people that go through such hell to even do half of what I did politically. Um, and there, and, but, it's not okay to just be slightly better than. We have to do our best. And what was happening in the detention center was not our best. I'm not an ungrateful Canadian. I, I just, being in there, I couldn't feel anything more about how un-Canadian this all was. The 20 summit was quite possibly the most photographed event ever held in the city. In addition to hundreds of news crews, 95 police security cameras recorded 22,000 hours of videotape. And then there was all that was captured on camcorders and cell phones. And yet, as recently as four months ago, Toronto's police chief was confident that none of it showed any misbehavior 
on the part of his officers. I've not yet seen any evidence or any video evidence, any photographic evidence of a police officer using excessive force or exceeding their authority. And up until that point, I had not. And today? I, there, there is a number of cases where additional video evidence has been brought forward. Including some of the video we've shown you tonight. The violence outside the detention center. Jason McDonald's arrest in that kettle. Okay, 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 okay. The aggressive way police shut down the free speech zone at Queen's Park. Where? 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 I'm surrounded. Where can, where can I go? So here we are. Pepper spray coming out here. People are just sitting on the ground. You can hear people, where do I go? Now here we're gonna see some rubber bullets, or hear some rubber bullets. Was that acceptable to you? Well, I, I have to tell you, I, I look at that and say that that matter clearly has to be investigated. It's not clear to me from the video that you just showed me what the justification for would be for the use of, of that force, and so the matter needs to be thoroughly investigated. And, and people are, are in our business held accountable uh, if they use a force for which mm -hmm. they, they can offer no reasonable ju justification. There has to be justification to protesters say for the numbers detained. The G20 marked the biggest mass arrest in Canadian history. I think it was very unfortunate uh, that, that 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 was necessary to do or, or was believed, it necessary or believed to necessary. Do? It's difficult to, to say in every case, and, and we're, we're investigating those cases uh, where complaints have been brought forward, and, and, and I think there was more than ample evidence that there was a very real threat, threat of, a, of an ongoing breach of the of that piece in the city of Toronto. And we had a, to, to try to balance a very difficult uh, set of responsibilities. Uh, did you well. get the balance right? Eight months later, <clears throat> can you say you got the balance right? Well, I, I think eight months later, we're still determining whether or not it, it was absolutely right. I think we did our best. I, I think, Is I that think, good enough? Um, well, that frankly will be for others to judge. Marise Poisson has made her judgment. Like everyone else in the university gym, she was charged, in her case, with conspiracy. Four months later, the charges were dropped. The police had conducted the raid without a warrant. That was a massive abuse of, of the power of police. I mean, that was a, they were, they were, there was just no democracy here during the G20. Jason McDonald agrees. He's suing police for what happened to him in that kettle. Anytime I see a cop now, my stomach twists because um, I, I, I just instantly wonder, is this one of the guys that dragged me away or stomped people in Queen, Queen's Park or whatever? Um, is this a good cop or a bad cop? That's my initial thought. The charges that Dorian Barton obstructed police have also been dropped, but he still lives with what police did to him, and he too is suing. The doctor's original assessment was that my range of motion will probably be, I'm looking at probably 80% once I'm completely healed, so I'm probably not going to get back to 100%. Has it affected your ability to work? It has, were... absolutely, yeah. And I have experienced waitering, but um, that's something I actually just can't do because of my arm. As for John Prine, he's taken his complaints to Ontario's Human Rights Commission. He also hasn't been able to return to his job at Revenue Canada. Right now I'm on uh, sick leave. Uh, um, I'm on antidepressants. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I guess, get over it. And it ended up, uh, I've, I've, I'm retiring early from work, earlier than I had wanted to. So many people said you should have stayed home and I just, I just don't even know where to begin with what's so infinitely wrong about that right. statement, you should have stayed home. As angry as he is at the police, and he is angry, Tommy Taylor is also disappointed at how few Canadians seem to care. And so he's decided to challenge them with a new play. Opening this spring, you should have stayed at home. I wasn't an activist before G20, but they've made me an activist now. They've shown me that there are 
reasons that we all need to use our voice. I guess who I was before is who most of us were before. And I really don't want something like G20 to happen to other people, to make them active, to make them get up off their seats. Eight months after the security fence came down, there are nine separate investigations into what happened in Toronto that weekend. Of the 320 people charged, 12 pleaded guilty. 86 cases are still before the courts.